and this has been recorded. Welcome everyone uh, to our first of a series of three goalkeeping webinars presented by our goalkeeping committee through NorCal Premier Soccer. Um, my name is David Robertson, I'm the coach education coordinator and I'm excited to be here and, and, and listen to what we have in store. I recognise many of the names from many of our previous webinars and, and it's always great to see the thirst for knowledge continue and the quest for knowledge to continue as well. So uh, we're looking forward to a great webinar. Um, our housekeeping, as always, um, unlike regular Zooms, your, your videos are automatically off, you're on mute. Please use the Q&A uh, versus the chat for questions. Uh, we will take as many questions as we can at the appropriate moments, both throughout the presentation and then certainly at the end when, when we, we summarize. Um, other than that, um, we'll, we'll introduce the clinicians in just a second. Again, we appreciate you being on. All material, unlike for the, the symposium at the weekend, uh, all the material we are recording this, we're sharing the video, we will also share the presentation as well because that's how we roll at NorCal. So Matt, if you can just flip to the next slide, I'll give um, our clinicians um, formal introductions. Um, we're delighted to have um, two of our three um, goalkeeping committee um, members, uh, Eric Franco on the right with the long hair and the, the longer beard, uh, is currently coaching at Napa Soccer Academy. He's our PDP Staple head coach. He's working with both the boys and the girls for the last three or four years, a uh, former Cal Poly alumni and, and, and a pretty decent guy for a goalkeeper. Um, Matt Bernard, uh, many of you recognize through his various roles in, in the area and, and San Juan Soccer Club as a technical director. Uh, he's also currently a ID2 goalkeeper coach. He was actually scheduled to go over the, on the international trip to, to England with ID2 prior to the, the COVID-19 postponing it. He's also worked with the US, I think the U15 national team with Benjamin and Hugo Perez. Um, and he is a Sonoma State alumni. Not able to join us tonight due to some, some college compliance, um, is, but still a very instrumental part of the committee, somebody we certainly need to acknowledge. Uh, many of the stuff you see is, is, is her slides is Lorna Brownlee. Uh, she's a Pleasant and Ridge Soccer Club um, goalkeeping director and she's assistant slash goalkeeping coach at University at Cal Berkeley. She's from my homeland of Scotland, and she was a youth national team goalkeeper. Uh, so again, Lorna can't present as part of the panelists, but please acknowledge the hard work and time that she put into making this happen. So without much further ado, I'm going to pass the baton. I think Matt's going to kick us off, correct, Matt? Yep. And again, yep. use, the, use, use the Q&A, and um, yeah. Let's go. All right, beauty. Uh, thanks first, uh, Robo, for having us. Um, thanks to Eric and, and Lorna. We spent, uh, we didn't think it would take us as much time to get through whatever ended up being 15 slides, but it took us a significant amount of time. Um, and what we, what we wanted to really do when we came at this was uh, come at it from a perspective of what can we do within our clubs? It's awesome that we get exposed to Ricard from Barca and Franz with all of his experiences. And, um, but it may not be always pertinent or realistic to what we're dealing with on the daily. So we wanted to really come at it from that perspective. Um, because we think candidly that all of us, um, ourselves included, because a lot of this came from what can we do better with our own clubs, um, can, do, can do more. <clears throat> and so kind of the five big things that we wanted to hit on today um, is how can you better incorporate your goalkeeper within your team, um, how you can create a common language across the club um, between both coaches and players um, that will be transferable be, um, through your age groups as they go. Um, one big thing that I think we will try to hit on more than once in this is creating a realistic training environment for all of your, all of your players, including your goalkeeper, um, and then translation of your training content into games. And then lastly, um, is the connection from your goalkeeper and or your goalkeeper coach and the way they train, is it connected to your club methodology or style of play? Um, so that's kind of what, where we started from and, and trying to get to, and, and we will go from there. Uh, assuming my thing will allow me to move now.
All right, before Eric jumps into that one, I actually skipped a slide. So I'm going to start on this one, Ian, then I'll go back to where we were going to go. As we were going through our discussions, we talked about, you know, what, is, what, are, what are our goalkeepers doing at San Juan? What are the goalkeepers doing at Rage? What are they doing with Eric and Napa? What are they doing in most of the clubs? And, and what we came to was most goalkeepers are training in all likelihood about one goalkeeper specific technical training a week within their club. Obviously, some are going and getting extra training outside of that. But when we looked at it and kind of tried to figure out how many hours are we spending, if you figure based upon a 40 hour or a 40 week season, roughly, which some of us play more or less than, your goalkeepers would be spending 40 hours a week specifically on goalkeeper training, whether that's technical training or whatever your club is doing, and 180 hours with their team if they were training three times a week. So obviously, this is fairly simple math, but we thought it was pretty um, telling about where the goalkeeper is going to get most of their knowledge from and most of their experience from. So that was um, also one of the things that we really wanted to, to spend some time on. So now Eric will jump in to talk about what you just saw in that video. As you guys can see in the video, um, the picture often is more something that we see as club coaches and actually as professionals do. But I think what we were trying to highlight with that video was the topic of playing out from the back um, and not building. Our job is so much more as a goalkeeper other than just you know, playing out from the back or for just other than just building up the play, but also understanding how to play in receiving and being able to feel confident to play outside of that. And a lot of us here acknowledge slash appreciate that the why is so crucial and can understand why goalkeepers playing out from the back is important, but I don't think we do a good enough job approaching the how. And so that's what we're going to kind of discuss a little bit now. And for like session and design and delivery, I think it's important for us, instead of telling the keepers to go warm up by themselves or over to the corner with their hands, to start trying to include them into the actual training sessions and challenge themselves to make them work or challenge yourselves actually as coaches to create a, you know, a session that actually incorporates the goalkeeper throughout the entire session, not just parts and pieces, um, during the session, because I think it is important for the goalkeepers to be a part of the actual whole training from the start to the finish. And then being timely and consistent with the communication. You have to be equal. You can't just treat your goalkeeper differently. Um, I think it's important that uh, players know that if you communicate to one player different than another. And I think as a goalkeeper, if we make an error, we know we've made an error, especially because it usually ends up being a goal. So you don't have to yell at us. Um, at that moment or in that moment. We can talk about it at halftime. We can talk about it a little bit afterwards. But I think it's really important for your communication with your goalkeeper to be, you know, supportive. And then we get into the realistic versus unrealistic scenarios. And I think it's important that we don't exclude goalkeepers from this, these types of situations. Um, you know, maybe they don't always are going to be in that type of situation, but I think it's important that you sometimes put your goalkeepers out of their comfort zone so they can handle the pressure with receiving the ball out of the back or um, being able to handle a situation where they might have to defend somebody outside of their box 1v1 and, and, and be comfortable in that situation, be able to make a tackle. Um, so some of these skills might actually translate more often than you actually realize. And then understanding the process of a learning skill. So when you're trying to learn something new, it takes time, practice, confidence. And so with goalkeepers, you can expect to do this in a game when it's rarely rehearsed. So if you don't actually train it in training, you can't really get on the case for not being able to handle those types of moments or situations. So I think one of the things that we're trying to say here is that we just want you guys to incorporate um, the player in the moment in the training because you guys do get to have them for such longer periods of time and as well for the goalkeeping coach it's really hard to just say hey go fix their distribution when actually they'll be distributing the ball more often in your actual training if you actually incorporate them next slide yeah i think yeah, yeah just uh one thing i think that we wanted to make sure we touched on here is in some of the in some of the clips of the video there you could see it was clear that the goalkeeper wasn't prepared for the moment, right? And so making sure to touch on what Eric's sitting on here, 
that we're creating the best environments we can where the moment is realistic. The one that stuck out to all of us, the, the kind of the brightest was uh, with the U.S. women when I think it was against Spain, where it was clear we didn't know what the plan was and it hadn't been well rehearsed and they definitely weren't ready for the high pressure. And then it turned into panic mode and a, and a gift of a goal um, at the top, top level. So um, I will go to the next one. So these are just ideas um, and just different ways of incorporating your goalkeeper and in training. We're going to start with the one on the left, um, top left, and it's a 5v3 session. And here you can have your goalkeepers defending one full size goal, or um, you can have the games going on simultaneously using the goalkeeper as a numerical advantage and to keep possession. And I think it's important here to actually correct your players when they don't pass the goal pass the ball to the goalkeeper in the right moment to hold possession because this is a great moment for goalkeepers to receive and be able to distribute and feel comfortable just like what happened in that video with the U.S. national team goalkeeper. She freaked out, lost her composure, made the pass, and then boom, the ball's in the back of the air. Here's a great way to practice it, get them practice, get them comfortable in these moments to be able to actually excel when it actually counts in an actual game. Um, the other side of that um, 5v3, you can see that there's a little end zone marker right there, that shaded area. And there we're just talking about how this allows the goalkeeper to maybe defend outside of their goal box. So working with their, moving their feet, having to defend a, a player 1v1 and not being able to use their hands. So you also teach your goalkeeper how to tackle outside of the box, which can be, you know, a, a difficult task or a difficult skill to master as it is anyway. From there, the great thing about this drill from the 5v3 to the 8v6 is all you need to do is pretty much collect those cones out of the middle and then boom, you're right into a beautiful transition into the 8v6. And here now you can use the second goalkeeper as maybe a target player up at top um, while you're still trying to work on playing out from the back. And your goalkeepers, and both of your goalkeepers are incorporated in the session. And uh, say your target goalkeeper who's playing the target player up top now can receive long balls up high and helps kind of connect the play in a different way in a different manner at the same time. But I think it's important that you let your goalkeepers have these moments because they will make mistakes. And here's the moments where you can guide them, support them, and train them like you would your own players when they make mistakes during training. So I think it's important that um, we don't just address the back line, always address the goalkeeper within a coaching point, especially when you're talking about playing out from the back. I think you need to incorporate your goalkeeper mentality a little bit more and think about them that they actually count as well in your session. They're, not, they're just not there for just shot stopping. But they actually do matter in the play. Matt, anything else you'd like to order? Just, I want to point out when we created these exercises, and this is actually um, one of the ones that Lorna spent a lot of time on, we try to take into account a realistic environment for what we all face. So we didn't, in a perfect world, this, uh, this session is probably done over an entire half or maybe even beyond, but rarely do we have more than a third of a field or a quarter of a field. So how can we navigate that um, objective within our regular environment? So I just want to point that out um, for people to see there. All right. So I think here's where we're going to give you guys an opportunity to ask some questions. If there's any questions that want to be asked, Robo, do you have any for us? One question related to that: What of the goalkeeper's foot skills results in the build-up breaking down every time? It's part of the process. I mean, it's uh, it's one of those that. Yeah, there, there obviously is, there can be that challenge, and maybe you, maybe you have to uh, adjust the session accordingly to where there's less pressure or perhaps a restraining line further away to allow for a little bit more time. But the only, the only real true way for the goalkeeper to learn in these moments during training is, is live action. Um, because of the decisions, the speed of the pass, the understanding of how fast they're being closed, et cetera, it's, it's harder to do when there isn't pressure in our opinion eric i don't know if you have anything else to add to yeah that. no i would totally agree i mean they have to learn um how to create better decision making in that moment in time and like matt said if 
you know, it's breaking down every time, then you might have to make some adjust, adjustments to simplify it a little bit to give your goalkeeper a little bit of advantage and build up their confidence and slowly, you know, add the restrictions or add the difficulty to, um, to increase the challenge. But I, I think if you just run away from it and don't use them because they always screw up, well, they're never going to actually learn. And then I think, again, at the same time, you're not really thinking about the consideration of the goalkeeper and their feelings and their actual want to, to grow as a player as well. Great. A couple of other questions related to this. Uh, which age groups would these be examples for? Uh, my personal opinion would be uh, the, the session on the left, I think you could do with any age group, personally, because it's more or less a possession-based game. Um, we also, we had another version of this, but to save some slide space, you could also have two separate goals to where if the opponent won the goal, they could score there. Um, but I think every, I mean, I've personally done exercise sessions like this all the way up to under 19s and, and in college. Um, and I've seen I've seen the Sac Republic first team do very similar sessions as well. Okay, and then just a question for clarification, and we move on. On the slide in the right, did you mention the goalkeepers a target there? But can the goalkeeper defend the right and goals, small goals in the right and the left, or no? From in this situation, the goalkeeper is more just a target player, so he's just okay. receiving, helping with the the control of the play. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. that's all for now. There's there's a few other. Oh, sorry, Matt, go ahead. You, no, no, I was just going to say I think. No, I think the, the biggest thing that we wanted to get out of that was if you have two goalkeepers, how do you involve the second keeper, right? Because we could have just as easily put the goalkeeper next to the goal and said, okay, they're going to rotate every time or every three balls or whatever that looks like. But this is now an option for the team that's building out of the back to have an option for a longer pass so that they can also break lines and skip lines um, in, if the pressure is high and that's, a, and that's a viable option for them. Yeah, and later on I'll talk about actually using a regular goal and the two small goals and then the goalkeeper actually defending all three. So um, it, and that will be a different um, demonstration. Great. There's a few other questions I think you'll, you may cover later. I'll keep them on okay. the docket. Beauty. All right, little video. All right, so if you, if you notice the title of this slide, this is actually a phrase that uh, I think uh, triggered all three of us, Eric, Lorna, and myself, because we've all been in exercises or in sessions from youth through college, even into professional environments that we were training in, uh, where the, the saying, don't worry, this isn't for you, or don't worry, this isn't about you, um, was used in, in regard to the goalkeeper. And our personal feeling is, okay, well then put a cone there or take a dummy and put it there. Um, because if it's not about me, then what is, what am I going to get from this? So as we go into this, just, I want you to think about that piece. We're trying, we're not addressing the, is there value of this for a, for an attacking player? Because clearly there's a value for them. Um, but we're, we're looking at it from the perspective of the goalkeeper. So, one of the things that we um, believe is when you're looking to create habits of a goalkeeper, especially in a training environment, uh, in situations like in the video you just saw, you already see the goalkeeper starting to cheat, starting to guess, starting to fall down. And in large part, it's due to unrealistic, um, unrealistic moments that they're seeing. The goalkeeper is seeing a guy receive a ball 12 yards out and literally just being able to pass the ball into any corner. So now it's survival mode and, and it's, all right, I'm going to try to fall this way. Ah, the ball went the other way. Um, it's not realistic to what in all likelihood will be seen in a game. And so it genuinely created some bad habits for that goalkeeper. You could see him starting to, you know, make some saves with his feet and, and every once in a while get to one. But otherwise it was kind of a guessing game. 
Um, some of the other things to point out when you're doing sessions like this, um, and I think we tried to take sessions that, that are common, right? So a pattern play to goal, uh, maybe it's an activation exercise as you'll see later on, but something where there isn't pressure. And so uh, from a goalkeeping perspective, in, in a moment like this that we're demonstrating that a ball gets played into the wide space and maybe it's the ball played back against the grain, well now, Either I'm tying myself to the line to try to have as much time to react as possible, or I'm going to cheat. If you're talking, I'm speaking for myself, I'm going to cheat as much as I can to try to cut out the ball. And in all likelihood, I'm going to be in the wrong position. So now when we go to Sunday to a game uh, and that ball gets into that wide area and I probably have some teammates near me, if I'm in the wrong position, it creates a different challenge for me, right? In an unrealistic um, environment. Candidly, as goalkeepers, we get discouraged. We got discouraged as players. We, get, we see our players do it. You get frustrated um, when you're just getting teed off on when there's no game context. Um, and, you know, we were, telling, we were all sharing stories. And I can remember a session in college where I literally just walked out of the goal in a moment like this and just said, this is stupid. I'm getting battered and people are just teeing off on me. There's no value of this for me other than to be a human shield. Um, so... What we, wanted to, what we wanted to show is a little bit, just a simple adjustment, and it's not even necessarily a game realistic adjustment, but a simple adjustment that may make an exercise just like this um, a little bit more um, realistic for the goalkeeper. In, in, in this moment, you put a player in at the near post space, and all of a sudden the ball that the player in the wide channel is playing uh, has to be out of their reach. And now the runs of the attacking players are a little bit more realistic because they can't just run uh, into a free open space. Now there has to be a little bit of timing. From a goalkeeping perspective, now I don't have to cheat into that near post space and I can be in a more realistic position to where I would be on the weekend in a game. And now I have the ability to potentially get out off my line and be in a better position to make a save. We believe that this is an opportunity, just a simple adjustment that gives the goalkeeper a better chance, right? It's not perfect. It's not, it's not, 100% game-like, but it still accomplishes what you want to get out of your team training, but gives the goalkeeper um, a little extra incentive and a little bit of extra time. The other piece that we wanted to add into this is we obviously have the target goals out to the side. Adding distribution into your sessions when your goalkeeper makes a save is what the next moment in a game is, right? It's what the next moment. It, it's not catch the ball, throw it out of bounds, throw it into your own goal. Franco could kill you for that. It's what's the next thing in a game. So continuing to improve in different technical areas um, while still being able to accomplish what you want within the team. E, anything, anything to add to that one? Yeah, I mean, it's just the fact of now the goalkeeper doesn't feel like he's by himself and it's a 3v1, it's now a 3v2. So it does make it a little bit more challenging and it gives the goalkeeper a little bit more of an idea and concept of where they are in space. So you're not creating those bad habits with the cheating or trying to maybe cut the angle a little bit differently because you know you're by yourself in that situation. So no, I, I think this is an easy way to kind of get some some shooting practice in, and but at the same time make it proactive for your goalkeeper. Perfect. Uh, you're up. So I pretty much took the same kind of idea that Matt was working on, but I brought it back more into the middle of the of the park. So. We're talking about playing more through the middle of the third, but I just said, hey, use your goalkeeper in the warm-up from rondos where they're playing around with their teammates to the activation play of passing drills and having them be a part of it. Um, as you look up there on the top left corner, those passes can be all different types, whether it's a driven ball, a chip ball, a curler, whatever you want in the passing situation, but it gives the goalkeeper plenty of opportunities to, um, to receive and also handle balls coming from them in different ways. So they become more confident with it. And then moving on to maybe a plat pattern play situation that I know and seen plenty of times that a lot of coaches love to do to give their players ideas and concepts. But now you're including your goalkeeper to be a part of it. And they can also work on their handling and distribution skills. So the middle, the middle one shows that, hey, the goalkeeper can receive a ball out of the air, distributes to their four and five, um, working on just controlling it while maybe the goalkeeper starts the situation they're playing a chip ball over the top or a driven ball on the ground whatever the age restrictions are or what you're looking for in the level of your player um i think that's where you design your 
your your session to. Again, at the end of the day, all we're asking for our coaches now is just to get a little bit more creative with your goalkeeper. Just don't send them to the side and say, hey, you guys warm up, catch the ball a little bit here and there, and then toss them into just a regular shooting drill. Make them a part of the actual drills and uh, to help them grow and become better. If you go to the following one, now this one's just more of a shooting drill. So now it's the same combination play, goalkeeper still working, but now he can get some, you know, shots warming up. You can tell that the, the player who's shooting has to shoot it with their right inside foot. So it, you know, it's not as a difficult shot. Maybe the curler with the left or whatnot, but now they can warm up, they get the, the hands going, but as well, the forward can get, you know, a little bit of a shot and they're all activating their body before you actually maybe go to the next level, which what Matt did, and that's to add a defender. And then you can make it a little bit more of kind of a game situation, which you will see in the next slide. So up at the top now, I kind of have that same idea or similar to what Lorna had uh, earlier, where we're playing a 65 possession game and you got your nine and your four up at the top and they're kind of on the outside and you're looking to play combination play to get out to go to goal but if blue wins it they can score on the small goals and it counts as two points or they can go or sorry i should say counts as one point or they can go to the main goal and it counts as three now is this game realistic of course not there's not three goals on a field but the idea is now you're including your goalkeeper to be a target player to help play out from the back to help red combine to go to the actual main goal, which is a little bit more game realistic. But again, you, you're, you have both goalkeepers going, both goalkeepers are active, not one goalkeeper just sitting on the outside watching the other goalkeeper play or watching the other ones play a regular possession drill. You just have them more activated and more focused. And I think this is important, especially if you you want to have your goalkeeper play a high line and be willing to receive the ball outside the back and, and feel comfortable outside of their situation because they have to understand that the demands of their pass here in this situation, if they make a mistake, can cause for a counter or could cause a goal. And so I think this is just a simple, easy exercise. Again, these are just ideas of how you can incorporate your goalkeepers and still achieve your outcomes in an actual training session. And then down below, it's just a 9v9 situation, um, just changing up the defense on the blue side, whether you're playing with two center backs or just one. And that just gives you a little bit of a different idea of how to play out from the back or how the strategies of attacking are. Matt, I don't know if you would like to add any other components to it, but again, these are just ideas that we're trying to give you guys to um, help incorporate your goalkeeper a little bit more in your own training. Uh, the one thing we want to also impress upon is, you know, coaching within the game, right? So coaching the goalkeeper within the game. So creating games like this where, one, there's going to be failure, inevitably, right? There's going to be failure so you can help critique and help connect, uh, and help correct them. It also creates environments. If you look at the, at the top session, there's more space, right? There's less players. There's more space. Um, now, can your goalkeeper play higher off their line? Can they go defend potentially those pug goals? if there's going to be a long ball played in behind um, just creating, creating some different uh, opportunities for learning and also for teaching for all of us. Um, and I think we can all say generally we have a game like something like this within our session. So now can you adjust it a little bit to make it to where the goalkeeper is more of a thought rather than just go in the cage um, as everybody's so accustomed to. So I think, E, we're now, uh, David, any, any questions on this? I think the, the one question I can tie to this is, is at what age do you start to, you're talking about goalkeepers playing off their line, what, what age, is there a certain age where you would start to encourage that? I think, I mean, if you look, if you listen to what Ricard said the other day, um, Barcelona is obviously encouraging it at a very young age. I think we, it's based upon your club's philosophy and, and style of play. Um, and candidly, your style of coaching. Uh, you know, one thing that we talked a lot about is as the ball moves up the field in games that we watch in our own clubs and in other games, uh, the ball goes up the field and we as coaches have a tendency to turn and look and watch the ball and not necessarily address our back line or even our goalkeeper to step and kill space and, and make the game more compact. <clears throat> so for me, I think that's at, at under nines and tens. Um, is is easy enough. Franco, I don't know if you have a differing opinion. 
No, I think it's important for them to start as early as possible. Um, and like you said, I think it really depends on your style as a coach. Are, are you, you know, wanting to play that kind of possession style of play and moving the ball up? And do you want your goalkeeper to be that kind of component that you kind of see in the Barcelona style? Um, but as well as that you're starting to notice a little bit in the EPL with Ederson and Allison. I think it's important for us to really kind of focus on building up a little bit, the uh, building that confidence at a young age so they start becoming better and more efficient with their decision-making even earlier, if possible. And Eric, putting your, obviously, uh, one of the, the head goalkeeping coaches for NorCal and PDP, uh, are you speaking in behalf, would you speak in behalf of the NorCal playing style? How would we want our goalkeepers to play? Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt in the NorCal, one of the biggest things that we talk about is the ability for them to feel comfortable receiving the ball, playing it out, and actually being a benefactor into the attack. So having the capability to receive under pressure and then finding the area in the right moment to, you know, maybe create a counter or open up the space behind. I think that's one of the biggest features that we do look at for our goalkeepers is how good are they at receiving balls? How good are they at handling pressure when they do receive a ball? And do they feel comfortable on the ball? Uh, I think a lot of times you'll see goalkeepers receive the ball and the first thing they've been told to is take the ball and they go and shank the ball out left or, or right. And uh, I think it's something that can be very much more focused on in trainings. And for us with PDP, it's one of the things that we always focus on with our goalkeepers is to do some type of footwork or receiving and playing out from the back because almost every training session that we have is of possession and building up. And then we try to include the goalkeepers after that small technical session to be a part of that. So the buildup continues to grow. So everybody's on the same page. Thank you. All right, moving on. Um, as we went through our discussions and, and we started to talk about candidly how our clubs work, right? We said, uh, how do you feel like you're working in a manner that's connected as, your, as a goalkeeper coach to what your club's philosophy and methodology is? Um, and we all frankly said, uh, no, we don't think our goalkeeper program is necessarily as connected as it should be. So one thing that we wanted to really touch base and touch on that here is um, if your goalkeepers are going over and just doing technical work and it's catching and diving and catching crosses and what have you, that's good. There's no, I'm not, we're not going to discredit that and say there's no value, but if it's, if it's lacking in connection to what your, um, how your teams are going to play on Saturday and Sunday, it may not be quite as valuable. So um, some questions that we went through here, does your goalkeeper training curriculum coincide with your club or team curriculum? Do you have one? Candidly, many clubs don't. They don't have a specific goalkeeper curriculum, my club included, right? And, and I have no issue saying that because it's something we need to do a better job of. Um, but it's something from a, um, a long-term development perspective that if there's a plan put in place that at nines we should be working on this and 10 we should be working on this and et cetera, and then communicate it to your coaching staff, it's a much clearer um, way of working and a much easier way when on Saturday you know, hey, Tommy is good. Tommy has been spending the last three weeks on building out of the back. And so uh, if, if Tommy makes a mistake, all right, fair enough. But he's been encouraged to do that for the last three weeks. And it should be connected in, in a perfect world to our club's, um, you know, microcycles as well, if we're, if we're using those things or, or at least our training plan. Um, one thing we also talked about, is your goalkeeper coach in your club ever get to go work with the goalkeepers and their team, right? To do something in an isolated manner um, again, is not invaluable, but it's disconnected. And so if I'm going to go coach Franco and I'm going to work with Franco on playing off his line in a training session with a bunch of goalkeepers, well, on Saturday, his team doesn't either plays really high or doesn't play high at all. I don't have that context because I have 45 teams in my club. So I don't know exactly how Franco's team plays. So now it's really a challenge for me to work with him and help him be successful on the weekend. Um, do you have a common language? So uh, do your goalkeepers speak the same way? Do your coaches speak the same way to each other? If I show up on a Saturday to watch a team that I don't see all the time, um, 
and I go to communicate with the goalkeeper using language X, but the team is used to something else, all I'm going to do as a goalkeeper coach or as a coach is cause confusion in those moments. Uh, and so it's, we believe it's really important to help them. Similarly, uh, do your goalkeepers speak the same language? If I say to Eric Franco, Eric, for some right, is it to my right or is it to the player's right? Because those are little details. And if we do this, now the goal's open and I'm going the wrong way. And so just getting to the point where um, you have a clear and concise communication, way of communication within your club is, is also helpful. Um, and then, you know, ultimately, if your club's playing out of the back, um, are your goalkeepers spending enough time working on that in their technical training? Is your goalkeeper coach uh, doing most of the serving? Because if they are, then there's probably eight or ten kids standing around while one person hits the balls with eight or ten kids standing around. Could you better develop those goalkeepers by having them do the serving, by creating environments where they're doing a lot of stuff, similar to what Ricard showed for those of you who were on the Barcelona one this weekend, small group training sessions where there's four or eight goalkeepers training and playing in real-life game situations um, in a small space but with other goalkeepers. We think that's a really good way of being able to uh, improve your goalkeepers quickly and have, have massive impacts on them. Franco, anything on this one? Yeah, I just think also what we kind of mentioned was, you know, it has to trickle down from your DOC to the coach, to the goalkeeping coach, all of you guys being on the same um, page, whether that means you guys have to have maybe Zoom meetings on the side and everything like that, especially now with, with everything that's going on with this pandemic, I think it's become a way of, of communication a lot easier. So having these little mini discussions after your weekend games, if your goalkeeper wasn't goalkeeper coach wasn't able to go to an away game and talking about, hey, these are the things that we noticed. Can we work on these things? And then also incorporating them into your training, be like, well, let's see, can we incorporate that into your actual training this coming week to try to help develop? I think is a big component. We're just saying, hey, if you are lucky enough in a club to have a goalkeeping coach use them and use them more into your actual trainings don't just put them to the side to do technical trainings by themselves because again there's that disconnect and you're not actually fulfilling the the best quality in coaching that you guys could because you know you could be focusing on one point as the coach and your goalkeeping coach could be maybe focusing on the the defending component with your goalkeeper and your back line and now you can kill two birds with one stone at the same time yeah, I think adding one more thing to that, Eric, um, celebrating the, the kids who are brave enough to jump into this position because there are so many that are – how many how many teams are there where I, I know my wife coaches two younger teams. They rotate through goalkeepers regularly because there's not one person that really wants to go. But can we can we find ways to get kids more excited about going to training, about being the hero on Saturday? Because obviously we know everybody celebrates the kid who scores the goal. Um, and that's been, you know, every, that's how every team, and that's why they get paid the big bucks. Um, but can we create that environment, frankly, within our own goalkeeper programs where kids are excited to be there and they want to go to training? It's not like pulling teeth. Uh, some of the conversations that we had was like, you know, do you ever have to, uh, do you ever have to go beg a kid to come to goalkeeper training? Because if you do, then there might be something wrong with goalkeeper training. And that, those were, those were personal stories that we told back and forth about, yeah, yeah, no, there are kids that don't come and you go over and say, Hey, I've got, we got training right now. I'm good. I'll, I'll stay here. Um, that's not the environment that, that you, that we're all trying to, I think, create. Um, all right. So uh, this is a, a video to, to piggyback on what we talked about uh, connecting your methodology to, or your, or your way of playing uh, or your way of training in your goalkeeper program back to the club. So obviously we found this because Ricard did a very good job with it this weekend. This is a thing will work.
So just to touch a little bit with that video and kind of the importance that I felt for that video was the fact that we all know that Barcelona is one of the best teams in the world, but the fact that they incorporate their youth and they actually promote their goalkeepers, even at such a young age, as you can see in that video, to take those risks, to challenge themselves to receive and play and take on that pressure, I think is an amazing component as a goalkeeper. Just knowing that, hey, as my coach, I can look over them and be like, hey, if I screw up, I'm not going to get my head cut off or get yelled at or get told I did something horrible because I'm trying to learn and grow as a goalkeeper. I think that's a huge important thing. And this area is something I think is really important for myself and that I continue to try to improve on and that's language matters, right? And it's just not what you say vocally, but it can also be your body and the way that you show your frustration. And I think as coaches, we don't realize sometimes the, the power that we have with just our behavior and what we do. Um, I think we all know that as coaches, we're trying to teach autonomy for the game and, and trying to make them better at making decisions because at one point or another, they want to, you know, as, as coaches, we're trying to make, maybe help push them to the collegiate level or the professional level, depending on where you're at. But I think if anything, how you teach it, you always have to be passionate. I think kids that see your love for the thing, for the game, your, 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 your passion and your energy, that's going to go miles and miles with your, your players. And, you know, I think as well is handling the mistakes and being able to be patient and the willingness to, to allow mistakes to occur for your goalkeepers to actually improve. Uh, I think sometimes that can be difficult because there is such a strong mentality in the U.S. to win, win, win now instead of sometimes thinking about, hey, let's just focus on the growth of our players. And especially with the goalkeeper, hey, we know when we let the, game, the, the team down. We know when we gave up a goal. We know that it's, it, it bothers us. It affects us. And I think that's sometimes um, a big thing that coaches don't realize because, you know, poor Billy over there screwed up and, you know, you let him know right away and we actually haven't done anything to solve the problem. You just told him that he made the problem. So I think that's something as well. If you are going to state the problem, you better also have a solution as a coach. And then you better also be able to teach them how to find their own solutions in the future. You can't just always tell them. Um, and this one I think was one of the big things that Lorna had mentioned was be authentic with all your players. So the way you treat your star forward or your, your star midfielder, you got to treat them all the same. You can't, you know, be sweet to one and then be harsh to the other. So I think it's really important for everyone to, to be truly authentic. You know, if you're, you're loud and you're passionate with your coaching style, be that way. But understand that at the same time, you need to be that way with every player out there. And where's your expectations? You know, do they fit what you want to do? Are you playing the style that actually matches – the, 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 the current level of your team, that sometimes I think is difficult because we get caught up watching all these great teams and we're like, hey, I want to incorporate that. I want to do that. But maybe you need to build up and create your own little curriculum or with your club's curriculum, build up to create that situation so they can get up to that level. Sometimes you just, you're jumping too many stages too quickly. And I think that applies pressure, especially on these kids to, not be able to handle. And so it's important that if you want to play a certain way, you have to be able to recreate those moments to help your goalkeepers be prepared. And I think one of the things that I've learned in the last couple of years of coaching is self-reflection and how important that is for my growth and being under, able to understand, did I just talk about the objectives and throw out the objectives or did I really teach those objectives and did my players learn those objectives? And I think, of course, at the end of the day, the game is the way that you find that out and you figure out if you actually taught what you were trying to do, but also making the notes of, hey, where I might need to improve on as a, as a coach. And so it goes back to always having the right idea with how you communicate to your players. So the, the body language that you show on the field that's supportive and always being there to back your player, whether they make a mistake as a goalkeeper or not. Matt, you got anything? Uh, I think, yeah, just a couple things. I was I was writing notes because I, I want to learn too, Eric, so thank you. Uh, I think there's a couple pieces in here. One, 
uh, how you handle specific goalkeepers at different ages obviously is really um, is really um, individual specific and and ultimately it's age group specific. If you hammer a ten year old for making a mistake, uh, you're probably going to negatively impact that kid in a very large way. If you get into a 19 year old kid or an 18 year old kid who's getting ready to go off to college who made the same mistake for the 50th time after being, having worked on it, it's a different thing because you're helping them prepare for that next environment. Because we all know when you get to college, when you get into the pro environment, there, there's not a whole lot of forgiveness, but creating the environment to where players aren't afraid to fail and they have the opportunities uh, appropriately along the pathway um, because ultimately we don't scream at our forwards if they miss a shot. We generally, uh, we will coach them and, and similar with our outs with the center midfielder. If, it's, if the 10 gives the ball away, trying to play a ball in that, that didn't come off, we're not going to scream at that player. Um, so with a goalkeeper, you have to deal with them um, in an individual way as well. Um, one thing that I think we, we talked about as a, as a goalkeeper collective, we've heard a lot of field player coaches basically say, Hey, I don't, I don't know anything about goalkeeping. Right. And credit to all of everybody that's on this, because you're obviously at least listening to um, something about the position, but I don't know anything about goalkeeping. So go over there or, or figure it out. And in that moment, you discredit yourself as a goalkeeper. And now anything you say to that player going forward, you are going to have to do a lot more to prove yourself rather than take the moment and, and to Eric's point, self-reflect a little bit, take zoom out and see what, what's going on so that you can better engage them. Cause candidly, they should be, we should be treated like they, we should be treating our goalkeepers like field players that are wearing gloves that are, have a tough job. Right. And, and there's a lot to expect of them. Um, yeah, that's my, that's my two cents on that one, Ian, unless you have something else to go with. I think you, you nailed the other parts that were really important there. Uh, David, any questions? I think this is where we're going to go into questions. Yeah, yeah quite a lot of questions. Quite a lot of questions. Are you at the question part at the end, or do you have a few more slides okay. before you want to dive in? Uh, I think we've Eric, we've got one more, right? Just the video. Yeah, I think the video, and then just kind of talking about the next uh, webinar. Okay, do you want some questions now, or do you want to show the video? No, it's good questions now. Okay, so I'll I'll tie them together as best I can because quite a few coming in on a similar subject. Obviously, there's been a lot of focus on the modern goalkeeper developing them tactically. Um, one question is, what what percentage would you would you would you train tactically with the goalkeeper? Obviously, the fee, the build up versus just the raw technical skills. Would you would you have a dosage per se on that? Eric, you're better at math than me. <laughs> So, I mean, if, if you guys were on the, the webinar with Ricard on the weekend, he kind of mentioned that, you know, the goalkeepers were doing like a technical training four days out of the week while maybe joining their actual training. I think it was three times um, out of the week or being part of that team training. So clearly the way that our structure is as, a, as clubs here in America don't really fit that structure that Barcelona has. So in reality, yeah, a lot of goalkeepers now are doing a lot of that technical stuff on the outside. Um, to that question, I really would say, hey, you know, if, you're, if you have a training plan in mind that you want to work for your team that doesn't include the goalkeeper, all we're asking really is, hey, is there a way that you can include your goalkeeper into that training plan and still get what you need to be done? And at that same time, without really thinking about it, you are helping them technically with their receiving and tactically at the same time by including them into those drills because they're going to have to make decisions. They're going to have to feel comfortable with their feet or whatever you have planned. Um, I do think though, ideally as a coach, I mean, I would, I would love to be able to have my goalkeepers at least twice a week for 45 to an hour to work on technical stuff, but that's just not possible nowadays with how the, the system is structured. So I think it's really difficult for us to, to say, hey, this is the amount of hours so you, uh, that you want to do. What do you got, Matt? No, I think, David, the, the biggest thing I think is, it's, are you talking about them within your team environment or them within their goalkeeper environment? Right? So if we're talking about, in a, is, is there, was there clarity there? Um, I'm just, I'd, let, me, let me look at the question one more time. 
I actually answered the live. It, I, I could, uh, I'll read it verbatim this one. So what is the balance you would recommend between isolated technical training and reality based for a goalkeeper? Should this balance be um, the two plus as the goalkeeper gets older? Should it be, should it change as the goalkeeper gets older? That's one of them. The other one was, should you focus more on the technique? So I tried to kind of balance a few similar questions together. Okay. Um, my opinion, so I'll talk about the tactical piece first, then I'll go to that, to that next one. I think um, if you're going to talk about the tactical side, I don't think it should be any different than what you would work on with your team. So if you're, if you're working on with your U12s on uh, pressing high, then the, then the part of the tactics that you would work with your goalkeeper on is their positioning when the ball is far from goal. Um, and maybe the positioning of how or how they would organize their center backs, right, or their center back. Where, where should this person be? Who should we be coaching? If the ball's on the left side, should we be looking on the right side? Those are little details that I think can be helpful. I, um, so from a tactics perspective, working in lines, working your way up the field as they get older, is, it makes sense. Because in a young age, they, they don't have the ability to see beyond, or they don't have as much of the ability to see beyond what's right in front of them and, and kind of see a bigger picture. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, from a technical perspective, uh, one thing that we talked about is, uh, I, personally, I'm not a fan of our goalkeepers missing a team training session to be inside of a goalkeeper training. Um, so creating the uh, goalkeeper technical training should be in addition, in, in I think all three of our opinions, to what you're doing within your team. So creating the ability for your goalkeepers to not miss their team sessions, or if they have to miss their team session, jumping in with another team in the club. So they're still getting that, um, that game-like environment uh, while working hopefully with their goalkeeper coaches in a game-like manner too. Franco. Yeah. I think, you know, when we're talking about the younger age groups, like U10s, U11s, I think it's more important for them to be learning the game than actually really focusing on technical skills. Um, do you have goalkeepers at that younger age that just want to play goalkeeper? Yes, of course. And so then you can have them do a little bit more technical stuff. But um, I do think it's more important for them to actually focus on their their skill set as a player and in, in learning the game and understanding the game. Um, because I do think goalkeeping is a, you know, a very tough situation on the body for for a lot of youth. And I think a lot of times you get caught with a lot of kids having – a lot of injuries or nagging injuries because all they're doing is diving this place or that place, doing high crosses and throwing themselves all over the place because that's what they see on TV. And they aren't really getting taught that, that proper technique or going through the smaller um, doses. So I think it's actually more important to probably start teaching technique around 13 after they've gone through one of their first growth spurts mature wise through their body. So they can actually handle the 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 pounding that comes with being a goalkeeper at times. Great question coming in here about um, how do you warm up a goalkeeper where you just have one coach? Should the coach be focused on the sixteen players, and and if so, who warms the goalkeeper up? Uh, are we I talking about like a game situation, or are we game situation, game situation? Yeah, I think, and that's a pretty common one, right? That we all, that many of us face. So um, I would encourage my personal opinion would be uh, either create a culture within your club where if you have another goalkeeper around, they can work with each other so they can create their own warm up, uh, but also involve the goalkeeper as much as you can, right? If you're doing rondos and you're doing technical possession stuff, um, they should be involved in that because candidly, they don't need to go spend a half hour in front of the goal catching crosses and 450 shots to where they're now tired before they jump into a game. So I think that's a common issue that we all face, even people with multiple coaches on the staff. Um, you know, the goal, I think creating a, creating a um, plan for your goalkeepers across the board would be a benefit to all of your, to your entire club. Yeah, I mean, my warm-ups for games usually are about 30 minutes in length just for the whole entire team. So usually the players will do their rondos, do their dynamic warm-up, and then if I do have two goalkeepers, they'll warm up for about five to 10 minutes together while the other team might do some type of possession drill on the side. And then we might do some shooting, but of course there's also a little communication to it. I don't really want my goalkeeper to take on, you know, tons of shots right before a game. Um, I rather them 
just get a nice little feel of warmth into their hands and feel like they got themselves into a nice rhythm and then get going because most of the the actual focus and work has been done the week beforehand in the game and that's where the real focus is and then game time it's just allow them to go learn and do their thing okay great question here um a couple of people with similar questions talking a bit more that the, the the technical aspect from, I guess, the hands. What have you, from a, for a young goalkeeper, what would you say are the most important technical components for a young goalkeeper? If you could split it into maybe two or three or possibly four areas for development for a goalkeeper, obviously for a field player, and I'm just paraphrasing a lot of this, is, is passing, is shooting, is, is dribbling. If you could break down the key goalkeeping skills, what would you break them down to be? Go ahead, Franco. I'll let you start on this one. I mean, unlike Matt, who's six foot four, and I came in at five foot ten, I think it really depends on what your what your goalkeeper is and what's the ideal image of a goalkeeper. I think for me, one of the biggest things is is he willing to be in front of the ball, right? Like that's probably the one thing. Can he get his body behind the ball? So I'd be working more on lateral movement and, and a lot of movement of getting your body behind the ball and just working on simple catching. Uh, you can't really, I wouldn't go into a W catch or a diamond catch or anything of those type of to topics because you don't know how big that kid's hands are or whatnot. And then you're starting to get too crazy on the technical stuff. I think more about just receiving and passing. Those are important things right off the bat for your goalkeeper to do. And, and that's why, I kind of said earlier at the younger age wise, I just want them to learn the game. I want them to learn how to strike the ball. I want them to learn how to receive the ball, be comfortable, you know, receiving the ball off their thigh and bringing it down and being able to, to do moves and, and feeling comfortable ball under their feet. But at the same time, you can bring in a little bit of catching, but I wouldn't be doing anything large or big, like trying to work on crosses or, you know, working on hyper extension dives or anything like that. Matt? Yeah, I think for me, uh, we're on the same page. Positioning, being in the being on the right angle, um, and I, I I do this regularly with small young goalkeepers. I'll have them go stand on their goal line and say, "Okay, here's the ball at the top of the crossbar. Jump and touch this." Most of them can't because they're young and they're small. Uh, so now there's no value of you standing on your goal line because that shot that goes over your head that we all see every single weekend, you're not going to save. So get off your line, be in the right place so that as you grow, you're learning and, you're, and you've got that habit already. Um, when to come off of your line and, and or play off your line. So again, a little bit connected to positioning, but learning how to come out for a one versus one, maybe a through ball um, and learning how to kill the space. Um, and again, those are, I mean, that's, that's maybe more of a tactical piece, but I think it can, can lead into the next one with the comfortability with the ball at your feet, being able to receive a ball comfortably and playable uh, ideally with both feet because obviously most players are one footed in our country. And then I would say the beginning of basic diving technique, right? Learning how to hit to Eric's point earlier, learning how to hit the ground properly so that you limit the wear and tear and abuse on your body. I, I see so many young goalkeepers um, flying around because they see it on TV and it's what they do. And it's great at 12, you can recover. But as somebody who's had two back surgeries at almost 40, it's going to crush their body. So doing it, teaching them in small doses how to do those pieces are really, really critical in my opinion. Great. And then the last question, I know this could be a, a long philosophical discussion and you've alluded to it and touched on it a little bit. And I'll read this verbatim. Um, so in build-up training, how would you handle situations for young kids, 9, 10, or 11, when in a match the goalkeeper makes a technical mistake from build-up, the parents begin questioning playing back to the goalkeeper, and even players begin to stop playing back to them for fear of mistake. How do you encourage the continued development of building up, not worried about result at that young age? There's a cracker. Yeah. That's, no, that's a good sure. one. Yeah. That's, I love that one. Um, it's funny because we, we were actually talking about this the other day. Um, it's a club culture thing. It's a, a country culture thing. I mean, if you go back to the Barca video, you've got the kid doing croips and, and pullbacks uh, when there's pressure on him. Uh, obviously, I think most of us on the call, our heart would start to 
we start to beat a little bit extra and we then we for fear of of an error um it's an education of your parents that we're going to play this way this is going to happen we are going to screw up we are going to make mistakes and it's okay that's not not to say that you're going to convince all of them because inevitably you won't um but you're creating that environment for the goalkeepers and for your field players to not panic and i would say um lorna actually texted me earlier and said celebrate celebrate when they do it right celebrate when you don't celebrate the goal every single time celebrate when your center back plays the ball to your goalkeeper and they get pressed and they get their head up and they snap a ball into the next kid and they break a line and all of a sudden this it becomes part of their uh dna where they're excited as much about doing that as they are about shooting the ball towards the goal because when you get when we get to that point um within our teams you're after the learning curve goes away, you're going to have created an environment where people want to play that way. I think it becomes part of your, um, part of your, your being, right? Like you don't want to play in a different way. Franco, you may disagree, but go for no, it. No, I think it goes back to language matter and what you're trying to do. And like you said, it's, it's all about club culture. And, you know, I think it's an important situation that you hit this topic after, you know, you do orientation after you get the teams all set up. It's right there on day one you're saying hey this is the style we're going to play we're going to make these mistakes what, what's going to happen but what i need from you guys is to be supportive and as coaches as well you need to be supportive you need to be like hey the mistake happens and you say hey it's fine keep your head up let's move on like this is the way that we want to play we know that's going to happen you'll get the next one it's got to have that kind of personality otherwise if you as the coach are saying these things and then you, you know, your body language says another thing, it really kind of tosses everything out the door. And, and then that's where you get that situation where kids don't want to pass that ball back to their, to, to, uh, to their goalkeeper because they're afraid of that. And they don't want to see coach get all mad and upset or frustrated. So it, it, it starts from day one. Um, it starts from talking to the parents and as a coach also, you know, having that strong backbone to be able to handle that, you know, you're going to get one or two parents not very happy with that type of play and, and understanding that, hey, I get that. I understand that you're focused on maybe winning more, but I'm focused on developing. And that's really what I'm here for is I want to develop these players. No kid's going to get signed to go play for, you know, any college division one program at U10 at this moment in time. And uh, I think that's important for you guys to realize that as well is that, mistakes are going to happen and as a goalkeeper the mistakes hurt more because they count as goals usually and so you just got to deal with it and don't worry about what the score is is you know if you get three build-ups out of the play and they, they work out and you score one that's fantastic if you give up 10 goals because of it hey celebrate the three that you did well on and that's all that really matters great great stuff guys so there are there are some other questions but in the interest of time maybe we can table them and, and bring them over this is the first of a Three part series, which we'll get to in just a second. I believe Matt, yep. you have one last video to show, and then we'll we'll do some housekeeping. Uh, yeah, uh, segment yeah. Next so time. perfect, beauty. Um, so as we as we got as we kind of honed in on our topic, uh, a player from Northern California posted a video of uh, his his I think his second year in college highlights, and um, it's a player. He's from he was from a small club in. Stockton, Stockton Storm, or and I don't want to call them small clubs, I don't know how many teams they have, but it wasn't a monstrosity, it wasn't a De Anza, it wasn't a well-known club, and he was a kid who showed up when I was working at the Sacramento Republic um, with the Development Academy, he showed up to tryouts, uh, and I think somebody recommended that we take a look at him, but frankly, we, were, we weren't sold on him, I wasn't sold on him, and I was one of the goalkeeper coaches, and, and we had long discussions about it, um, and we weren't sold on him because he was 15 years old, and his feet sucked. And I'll say this because I had this conversation with him and asked him for permission to do this. But his feet were bad. He couldn't trap the ball and pass the ball. He couldn't strike a ball over distance. He really struggled. Um, but we took one of our coaches was adamant. This kid has the potential. We have to give him a shot. And so we all agreed. And he struggled through like anybody does, um, trying to play in a in a high intensity environment. But over the over the span of the last three and a half years. He's um, morphed into this player who is confident, and I'll show you the video. Um, but the point of this is um, don't give up on someone just because they don't look the part in the first moment. If there's that, if they have that desire and they have that drive, 
uh, and you can create an environment. And candidly, I only worked with it for a little while before I left the Republic. So this is not a, hey, look what I did. It's a, the environment that the kid was in, put him in a spot where he won, I think feels and breathes the style of football that you'll see here in a second. Uh, and two, um, has developed into something that he will, if he continues on and stays healthy, likely have a shot at being a pro. Um, and I don't know if that would have happened if he didn't get put into an environment where he had to get better at it. So I'll play the video and then we can finish with that. Assuming the video plays. Matt, where's he playing right now? Where's his game? Where, where, who's he playing with right now? So he's, he's a sophomore at Gonzaga University up in uh, Spokane, playing in the WCC. Okay. So this is a game. This is, a, this is one of his highlight films. This is just a piece of it, but this is all just a distribution piece. So, you know, what I, what I really just wanted to leave everybody with is, um, you know, this is, this is a, an example of a player who, who, through his own hard work and through an environment that was challenging to him, because it, uh, it wasn't always easy, because we were not, we as a staff were not easy on our goalkeepers, um, nor, were his, nor were the teammates, to be fair. And he wasn't the starting goalkeeper until he was, I think, into the U18s or U19s uh, at the Republic. But he has continued to press and continued to work. And, and as I was, re when I reached out to him to ask if we could use the video, he said, hey, absolutely. If, if any goalkeepers or any coaches can come away from, you know, at 15, there's still hope um, for this. This is, that, that is a message that can be sent. So is he going to go play at Barcelona? Probably not. But he's playing at a very high level in our country and, and will likely have an opportunity to play as a pro at some level, hopefully in Sacramento. Um, as a homegrown for the Republic when they're in the MLS. So I just wanted to leave with that because it's a real life example of somebody that's in our area. Great. Well, guys, uh, fascinating stuff. Um, the good news is for those that have enjoyed it, which based on the number of people that stayed on the call is always a good sign. It was, it was intriguing. It was engaging. Um, and we uh, look forward to part two next week, same time. Uh, there, is a, there, is a set, uh, there is another registration link uh, you have to register for next week. It's on the on the website, norcalpremier.com, club webinars, and then just look for the date. We will post a video of this presentation tomorrow. Um, it will be on there, and, and you'll have access, but you'll also get a follow-up email uh, with a link. Um, Matt, why don't you self-explanatory for next week, or do you want to talk about it before we close it out? Yeah, I mean, obviously you can see the, t the title here, but we're going to talk about the psychosocial aspects of why, um, I don't want to sound like a scientist because I'm not, I'm a goalkeeper, uh, of why the integration of the keeper is, is really, really crucial to your team and the player's success. Um, and we'll talk a bit about, we'll touch more on communication and dealing with the, dealing with the goalkeeper in moments that may not be easy as a coach that we hopefully can give you some insight from our own perspectives and experiences as both the players and coaches um, on ways that may help you. Great. 
Well, for those people whose questions I couldn't get to, I uh, apologize. Uh, hopefully we can try and, and post some of them next week. Um, again, on behalf of everyone at NorCal, thanks to Matt, thanks to Eric, uh, thanks to, to Lorna, who's a big part of this, who could be on. Um, but most importantly, thank for you guys. Um, there's over 100 people on this call, and I venture to guess that not all of them are goalkeepers or goalkeeper coaches. And the very mm -hmm. fact that you take the time to to put your goalkeeper, despite, despite what Matt says, we do care about the goalkeepers, we love them. Um, the fact that you're on here to, to, to open up your horizons, perhaps, and find some solutions is a credit to you guys. So hopefully you got something from it. I certainly did. And if you didn't, we're back again next week till we hammer it home. <laughs> again, thanks to everyone. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Eric. Cheers. Good night. Cheers. All the best. Appreciate you guys. Bye-bye.